I'm just really excited for the opportunity to spend some time talking about um, the Ozark trilogy and um, Suzette Hayden Elgin and her work more generally. Um, so I, I wanted to start with a backstory of how I was even exposed to this novel. Um, when we first moved to Fayetteville in 2010, one of the things I'll, I always do whenever I go somewhere is I go to bookstores and I always go to bookstores and I especially look for things that might give me insight into the region where I am or where I'm going to live. So I was in Nightbird Books and I picked up one volume that was essentially like an analysis of Walmart as a neoliberal cult, uh, which was an important though harrowing read for me as I was moving down here. Um, I picked up another volume of Tim Ertz's books on trail hiking, which has been very useful. And then I grabbed a copy of the Ozark Trilogy, um, the one that is published by the University of Arkansas Press. And um, I see that David Scott Hunting Cunningham is on here, so I, ha I have to confess to you that I did find it on the sale rack um, there, uh, and that was one of the ways that I was tempted into first buying it because looking at it, I had no idea of telling like what it was going to be. Like, is this going to be um, kind of a, uh, a local vanity author? Well, the Arkansas Press thing helped enough for me to think, no, it must be more than that. But I'd never heard of Hayden Elgin. So I picked up that book and then I had, um, our third child was born and we moved here. And it sat on a shelf for a few years and I didn't read it. Um, and this is one of my great sadnesses because um, uh, uh, Suzette Hayden Elgin was still living at that point. Uh, she died in 2015 and I would have had the chance to, I guess I could have had the chance to meet her if I would have gotten into reading the book um, earlier, but I didn't. Um, it took a, a few years for me to have the brain capacity, parenting small children to jump into this. But I did um, eventually pick it up and read it. Um, and what stunned me when I read it, and it only took a few pages into the novel for me to start feeling this way was essentially, why hasn't Suzette Hayden Elgin gotten as much attention as many other big name uh, science fiction writers? Um, her, the quality of her uh, world building, the quality of her prose, uh, just the kind of the sheer kind of joy and um, uh, persnicketiness, I guess you could say, or I don't know what all the right words would be uh, of, the, of the characters and kind of the tone of the novel itself just had me from the very beginning. And by the time I'd finished the trilogy, it was already in my top 10, easily top 10 or top five things I've ever read. So I finished it up. Um, I started telling people about this book and I, I've almost always consistently, and I, I just don't understand this, and, and maybe all of you today can help me understand it a little bit better, but it has been the hardest sell of any book that I've ever gone around recommending to people. Now I do recognize that uh, book recommending is fraught, right? So like if you buy a book for somebody and then like two months later you ask if, they, if they've read it, you're not really supposed to do that because me telling you what you should read is always kind of a fraught enterprise. But I've all, I constantly have been bringing this book up um, and often with, not a lot of success of getting people to read it, even people who are into things like Southern culture and science fiction. Uh, but I've decided that I got to persist and maybe there were some strikes against Suzette Hayden Elgin or maybe some strikes against the novel on first blush that have kept people from really jumping in. Um, the other thing that I think that's probably true and then I'll get into the novel itself is that 
uh, she was writing, and by the way, she, I don't know how many of you have already noticed this or maybe read in her Wikipedia entry, but um, her name uh, as, um, if, you, if you were to do her initials, her initials are she, uh, which becomes significant when we're talking about uh, the kind of work that she was up to in her novels. But um, it's simply the case that in the era when she was writing science fiction, um, it was harder. It, it was a harder um, hill to climb for female than male authors. And um, so it could simply be that some of her stuff is kind of like gone, uh, at least for a time, uh, out of print or become unavailable because the culture at that time sustained more interest in popular male novelists like Isaac Asimov or uh, um, Robert Heinlein or other uh, big name uh, science fiction novelists. But so now let's I'm gonna jump straight into um, the Ozark trilogy. So the way the Ozark trilogy starts, um, it, it's this this fantastic opening couple pages. Um, everybody's in church. Um, a guy rides through the air on a mule through the middle of the church, steals a baby, and then puts the baby in a magical bubble suspended up in a tree near the church and then disappears. And the novel is being told from the perspective of a young woman. She's uh, 14 years old and her name is Responsible of Brightwater. And she starts explaining why this is more troubling than you might think. Um, it, it's a, yes, there's a theft of a baby, but then uh, the, oddly, the kidnapping isn't a kidnapping that takes the baby very far away. The, the baby is suspended in this tree right, set right outside of the church. And some people who are magic users in this world know enough to know that you could easily dispel the bubble that the baby was in unless the spellcasters had hidden some kind of additional spells inside of that spell that could be damaging, in which case you'd burst the bubble and also kill the baby. And so they have to all get together and make a decision. What are we going to do? Um, how are we going to respond to this act? And also, this is just weird. You know, we've been living for a thousand years in, um, in the world of Ozark. And generally speaking, things like this don't happen. And so then the novel starts to open out to help you understand why this moment is so unusual and like why um, maybe something as troubling as this is happening at, partic at exactly this time. Uh, it turns out that the 12 um, uh, nations um, that are part of uh, this world of Ozark are going to be having a meeting relatively soon where they make a decision about how, how and whether they're going to maintain their federation as a set of nations. And so some of those, some of those um, countries are more or less interested in maintaining the, the union. And so it could be that somebody is trying to create turmoil or dissent so that by the time they actually get to that meeting, that's part of it. And then you get introduced to this culture. So uh, imagine, this is what you need to imagine if you're, if you're decided you're gonna take a stab at reading the Ozark trilogy. The premise of the Ozark trilogy is that a group of peoples, predominantly, uh, it, it, it was a thousand years ago, so they don't have a full memory of who all came to the planet. It's been so long that some things have been forgotten, but essentially there were these people groups in, from Earth, from the Ozarks, who decided to move to a planet far away from Earth. <laughs> and it was in an era when um, some Earthlings were settling the wider galaxy 
but apparently the Ozarkers were early. Um, so they, they have these spaceships that they get in. They, they fly in the spaceship to this new planet. Um, she doesn't go into a lot of detail about exactly how they accomplished this, but it seems to be the case that it was like one spaceship powered by magic somehow. And once they arrived on the planet Ozark, then they were, um, they were done using many of the technologies that they needed just to get there. Uh, and so part of the commitment by all of these Ozarkers, no matter where they went, uh, settled on this planet was to only adopt the parts of the technology that they thought would be, that would contribute to the thriving, the kind of culture they wanted to develop. So over the course of the novel, you find out, for example, that they voted not to you have robots, even though that was um, a technology that they had as they were coming to the planet. But they did keep a uh, communication network between the 12 nations. So they have like comm sets at the, um, at the castle, kind of at the center of each uh, nation, and they can get communication between those places around rather quickly. Um, they they do keep certain kinds of like conveyances, like multi-passenger vehicles that are powered by solar. Um, but then at the same time, they use magic and more traditional methods to settle the planet and to cultivate the land, et cetera. So it's, it's in this way, it's, it's a lot like anything you might hear or have had discussion around if you are familiar with, um, Amish or Mennonite communities where there's a kind of a, a commitment to um, using technologies, but only in ways that are fruitful, either for like their community as a whole or their religious sensibilities. And each nation varies at, in the level of uh, technology that they're willing to use. So there's a couple of outlier groups, like one group's called the Travelers. And the Travelers are known across the planet for being very uh, anti technology and they, they, they have a, a very serious kind of demeanor in, in everything that they do right down to their clothing choices. That's more along the lines of what you imagine with conservative Amish communities. So they, they land on the planet and then there's this origin story that they, they tell themselves, although it's way back in their history that um, they did crash land into the ocean on the planet, some kind of beings, very large beings that are like whales with legs, lifted them up out of the water, brought the ship to the shore, and then the lead granny uh, leads the way to the settling of the planet. The whales disappear into the ocean and the um, the, the Ozarkers have never had interaction with those creatures that are in the oceans ever since that initial, that the, that the whale saved them. And then um, as they settle the planet, they maintain these cultures. Um, and the, what they maintain is they maintain a kind of a traditional family uh, community culture uh, a big marker of the Ozarkers is there, there are essentially two, rather than just one authority within the communities, there's actually two, but each has a different kind of power. So the one kind of authority are the grannies. And the grannies use granny magic. And granny magic is more around healing and um also like divination, like getting a sense of what the future holds and those kinds of like um, more mystical and care forms of magic. And then there are male uh, magicians, they, they have to be male. Um, and the male magicians, especially the magicians of rank, which are the highest ones who really have uh, the, the power because of the magic that they hold, the, the, the magicians of rank cast uh, magic that's much more mathematical. They, um, they actually use certain kinds of verbal calculations, like formula. It's essentially like if you thought of spell casting as crossed with calculus, that's what um, 
this kind of magic is. And it's the kind of magic that you see in like super high powered role playing games or fantasy worlds. They can literally instantly transport themselves to other places, or they can use a transfiguration to completely replace a person with a pig, or um, they can they can do all of these very high powered acts. But the one thing they can't do is they don't have the power to do the granny kinds of magic. So they can't see into the future as easily. Uh, they don't get, they don't have a sense of like oracles that they can tap into. Um, they can't, they're not healers. They're more of these like engineer magicians. And then there's a couple of things that are maintained that are deeply a part of the culture that are magical, but are also based on the planet. And the most humorous part uh, of that, and you you see, keep seeing these uh, recurring over and over again. And I'm actually going to show you a picture here. And I probably need to get rid of the background for a second. My background is a map of the world of Ozark, which is also in the book. Um, but uh, go to none here for a second. So here's the cover of the original Ozark trilogy, and here is responsible of bright water where uh, riding her mule. So there are these creatures that they discovered on the planet. They're native to um, this planet who willingly submit, I guess in the same way that like dogs and cats submit to us and certain kinds of um, community with us, they, they put up with the ways we pet them or lead them around on, on uh, leashes um, because there's some benefits apparently. And, and although the, it's not clear to the Ozarkers what all the benefits are to the mules of being in this role, they are willing to perform this role. And what mules do is mules are um, their airplanes. So the mules fly uh, 60 miles per hour and it's the main high speed form of transportation other than the rank magicians of rank who can teleport places instantaneously. And um, there's one description in this book that I just love. It describes that, that the uh, most of the mules, especially the ones that are named and are proud, they never deign to actually look like they're running in the sky. So while they're flying around the uh, planet, and somebody's riding on their back, they just kind of like dangle there in the air and just kind of ride along. Um, those are the mules. And so um, the book then continues with this moment and it's just kind of fascinating. There's this one character responsible of Brightwater who is the kind of like the reincarnation, although not exactly, but there's always, um, what one of the cult, one of the deep cultural parts of the Ozarkers is the grannies name everyone. And it's a big deal to give people the right name. And once in every generation, a girl was born and her name is responsible. And then that they know that if that responsible is going to play a special role within the culture. And so this responsible of Brightwater has been doing what other responsibles have done before, which is she secretly learns the high ma magic of the magicians of rank in addition to uh, living with the women and learning granny magic. And so at 14, she's like this savant. She can, she's better, more gifted at the high magic than the um, magicians of rank. And she knows granny magic. And the reason that she has all of this is remains, at least for a time, relatively mysterious. You're just like, well, here's this 14 year old who's kind of like leading everything and everybody lets her make the decisions. So she gathers this group together, all the grannies get together and they have to decide like, what are we gonna do with this um, baby? What are we gonna do about this baby? And responsible, decides that her job is to go on a quest. And so she has the grannies all consult about this. They decide this is the way to go. And so she puts on this 
in, in a way it's kind of like a cosplay regalia. It's not how she normally dresses, but she puts on all this fancy stuff. And she, that the first novel of the three is her just going on a quest. So she goes to every, all 12 of the nations, visits each one in turn. And, and the grannies announced to her that this is the right thing to do. She should go on a quest, but if it's a real quest, it has to be a real quest. And so she starts going on the quest and when everything is easy for her, some of the grannies actually like throw stuff at her magically because they want to make sure that it, the quest fulfills the purpose of a quest, which includes um, dangers, risks. Um, and but her what she's trying to do as she visits each one of the kingdom is both get a sense of what's going on in the nations and then also see if she can get to the bottom of who has made this baby um, suspended in this bubble while the rest of the baby's family, the, 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 you know, the, the fam, there is, there's one family in each nation. That's like the lead family. They're the officials and they're camped out underneath this baby. Um, wondering what's going to happen and have to live there for months. And so she makes this trek around. I'm going to pause there for a second. Uh, that was a lot to start out with, but I, I wanted to pause and see if anyone has any initial like questions or wonderments. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay. Well, then I'm going to pull this up. Uh, can, uh, can everyone see this uh, yes. map, I hope? Okay, great. So um, responsible of Brightwater lives in Brightwater, which is up in the northeastern part of that map there. So she lives in Mark Twain. Um, and so one of the things she has to do is decide how she's going to make this trek. And this is a very, very big um, world. If you look down at the bottom, you can see that the scale is 4,000 miles, which is just one small part of the map. So she decides to, you know, get out and ob obviously she could either visit like the close other nations like McDaniels and Purdy. These are all the names of the families that lead each one of these nations, or she could pick them up on the way back, but she has to make a decision about where she's going to go and who she's going to visit when. And some of those decisions have political consequences, depending on how close some of the nations understand themselves to be to Brightwater. Um, but uh, what, one thing that probably may be simply a fun to the people that are listening today to this presentation, notice how um, Suzette Hayden Elgin has named everything after modified versions of locations in the Ozarks. Um, so Arkansas gets central place on the map. Um, that's where Suzette Hayden Elgin is from. Um, she uh, lived in Huntsville, Arkansas. You get Missouri right in there, tucked in there next to Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, and then you have these family groups that are so some of the, the uh, countries, they're not really countries, are, um, have more than one family that um, leads portions of them. So they're, it's kind of like North and South Carolina. So you have the Lewises and the Motleys or neighbors on the, on the landmass of Missouri. And, the, and there are three families that are on the uh, landmass of Arkansas, whereas as compared to the Travelers and the Womacks who are considered to be the like the more um, backwards groups um, are off in these much more remote locations, uh, which is uh, kind of funny, but also accurate. Um, so she's got this map that she's drawn out that kind of gives a sense of the, the world. And this is one of the things that I find about just 
fascinating about Suzette Hayden Elgin is the level of world building that she engaged in. It's so comparable to some of the other great novelists that we now just kind of live in awe of. Um, you know, like the obviously uh, the the most prominent example would be J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien. Um, she did a number of things that were quite similar to how he engaged uh, his creative process. So, you know, he was a um, synthetic language uh, creator and created multiple languages for um, Middle Earth. Uh, Suzette Hayden Elgin did not create a separate language for the Ozark trilogy, but she did create an entire synthetic language um, for uh, the, I'm going to kind of show you these. I, I promise this will be kind of a little bit of a show and tell, so I'll do that. But um, the Feminist Press just recently published the uh, Native Tongues trilogy of um, Suzette Hayden Elgin. And this trilogy, which takes place on Earth before things end up at this um, global level, uh, she created an entire synthetic language, uh, La Adan. And you can actually pick up now from Union Street Press an entire um, handbook to uh, La Adan, which is um, what she understood that language to be is based essentially kind of like a feminist language. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Native Tongues trilogy, it's a language that gets developed only by the women. Uh, the men don't know it. And um, that plays a wider role in what happens in those works because there's only one family who does all of this like translation work between extraterrestrials that humans are meeting. And um, so they have all of this like influence and power and it's the women among that family who have still maintain all these like traditional family structures, they develop this special language, which ends up playing a role uh, in, a, in a pretty deep way with how later generations of women are formed and how they kind of end up separate from and, and able to relate to these extraterrestrials in different ways. Um, so she does all this kind of like world building that's just really incredible. And so that's the other piece to know about the Ozark trilogy. So I mentioned the split in the magic uh, between the, the magicians of rank and the grannies. I mentioned the space travel that occurred. That's like kind of the founding story. Uh, I also find this funny because I think a lot of you probably know that what a lot of, um, a lot, what a lot of Midwesterners did. I know this was true when I lived in Wisconsin. I think it's maybe true for some Southerners as well was they traveled from like the place where they originally moved from, like say, you know, like in Wisconsin, it was where I lived. It was these Norwegians were like, we got to get out of Norway. It's really, it's really bad here. And then once they got to the place they were moving to in Wisconsin, they've never moved again. It's like a lot of my parishioners in the church in Wisconsin, they'd been there for seven or eight generations. And this Ozark trilogy is like the, the, the big, like the most, imaginative example of that kind of culture you can possibly create. It's like, we got to get out of here. Things are really bad. Let's go to another planet. And then once we get to that planet, let's like destroy the spaceship and never be able to leave again and hope that nobody ever visits us, you know, and that's, um, that's what they do, but they can't get away from the fact that the universe is very big and has a lot of um, things in it that will catch you by surprise. So it turns out on the planet that the Ozarkers settle on, there's actually two other intelligent races, at least. Um, one race uh, is very reclusive and won't, um, won't really even interact ever with the Ozarkers, wants to be left completely to themselves. And um, those are, those are the scaries. And then there's another race that basically look like big cats. 
and they more periodically interact with the Ozarkers, but not very often live underground. Um, and there's a couple of different parts, places on the planet where what they basically do is they negotiate these agreements that are from when they first arrived of like, we're just going to peacefully coexist on this planet as long as you Ozarkers don't um, invade these specific spaces that we have set aside for ourselves. So there's those two um, intelligent races on the planet, along with the, whoever it is or whatever it is that's living in the ocean that saved them, plus the mules who seem to be much smarter than you might think at first. Um, so maybe as many as four intelligent races that lived on the planet that a lot ends up allowing the Ozarkers to live with them. And then there's this other thing, and this is what makes responsible responsible, called the Out Cabal. And the Out Cabal is a group or a federation of planets that live in this part of the universe, this system, and they all use uh, magic as the primary way that they power their, uh, that they power everything. And the Out Cabal has certain kinds of rules about whether or not they will impact like lesser um, developing species. And so the big uh, kind of overall dramatic structure of the Ozark trilogy is at a certain point, things become so unstable among the Ozarkers that um, the Out Cabal decides that it would be within their legal rights to mine all the resources of the planet, all the magical resources of the planet. And it's responsible's job uh, to figure out a way to like defend the planet from that. And the reason it's her job is because she's the only one on the planet historically, because this is how the first responsible was named, who the Out Cabal speak to. And the way that the Out Cabal speaks to people is through mind speak, telepathy, which is not naturally part of the magic of the Ozarkers. And so uh, when they do speak to her the first time, it's like this, it's, it almost destroys her, it gives her this massive headache. Um, so from then on, the way that the Out Cabal speaks to responsible is through the mules. <laughs> so uh, she'll get a message somehow that she needs to go out to the mules and then the mules will mind speak to her delivering messages that the Out Cabal delivered because apparently the mules can handle the mind speech of the Out Cabal better. And that's how they know all these things that are happening with the Out Cabal. Although the Out Cabal never visit, they only send the mind speech. And so it, for all you know, there, there's some kind of larger deceit happening um, they, they just have to trust that whoever's communicating really is representing this like um, extraterrestrial cultures. And so responsible ends up being this incredibly fascinating character because she has, she, she's literally living the intersection of three things most that, that basically none of the Ozarkers experience. One's completely secret, one's illegal, and one she's involved in too early. So she's she has to become like a granny before she's a granny. It's illegal for her to do uh, the magic of the magicians of rank, but she learns to do it anyway. And then nobody knows that she, other than the grannies, that she has this secret connection to the out cabal. And so another really kind of enjoyable and pleasant aspect of these novels is walking alongside Responsible of Brightwater in her kind of learning and being forced to be mature so early in her life um, and her admitting the failures and the, the missteps that she takes. And she's just, she's also just tired all the time because there's so many demands placed on her. That's a, in my rereading of the novel this time, that was the thing that stood out for me as Responsible is constantly tired, which is how I've kind of felt during the pandemic. Um, so that the that's the the big dramatic kind of like structure or thing that kind of keeps you drawn in is the, are they going to survive this pressure from the out cabal? Are they going to resolve the tensions between the nations? And there's a couple of really intriguing surprises that uh, come up along the way that that uh, I won't reveal because I don't want to reveal too much about the novel for those who are actually considering reading it. 
there's one more, uh, even though it's a trilogy, it's actually more than a trilogy. So I'll show you this too. This is the last thing um, before I just open it up for questions and discussion. Um, uh, Suzette Hayden Elgin wrote one other series. So you got Native Tongues, you got the Ozark trilogy, and then she wrote the Coyote Jones uh, novels. And the Coyote Jones novels are the space opera. Um, so I, th I think that the, the whole, all of the novels are part of the same world in a sense, but um, the Coyote Jones ones give you the, the you know, they draw the lens back and allow you to see the, the, the wider galactic uh, culture as a whole. Coyote Jones is this, um, the, the universe's strongest communipath, which means he can project mind speech out to hundreds or even thousands or maybe even millions of people at the same time. And he's also deaf to most other emotional mind speech back at him. Um, and so he makes a really good, for that reason, he makes a very good uh, diplomat to these other nations. And so that's what he gets, he uh, gets assigned to do. Well, in one of the novels of the Coyote Jones series, Coyote Jones visits Ozark. And I, this is, I wanna end with these geeky images because it's just so fun, but I love this. The, you know, the, the, all these Pulp Fiction novels from the 80s and the, the level or the lack of a level of uh, quality art. But here's Coyote Jones crossing in a spaceship. And here's Responsible of Brightwater um, watching him crash. Uh, so there's, this is actually the fourth Ozark novel. Um, and then there's a series of Coyote Jones novels, and this is really fun. Uh, so there's uh, At the Seventh Level. You're gonna get some different aesthetics here. You get uh, Furthest, different kind of artist here. And then this is my favorite one. I, I've been scouring um, used bookstores for these over the past couple of years. And I found this one. Um, this one is uh, the communipath, and it also has the noblest experiment in the galaxy. It's two books in one, but backwards. So like you read all the way to the middle, and then you have to flip it over and read the other side. And I, I, if I remember right, I saw a few of these when I was a kid, but I don't think they did this very often. And um, so there's one para novels like this one came out in 1970 so it's two years older than me um two novels in one of uh of Suzette Hayden Elgin and initially the Ozark trilogy was published separately each one is a volume um so like here's the third volume of the Ozark trilogy that a parishioner gave me okay now circling all the way back around to the local color story here um, it turns out that one of my parishioners, um, Doug Williams, who sings in our church choir, um, what has been for um, uh, multiple years, the roommate of uh, Suzette Hayden Elgin's husband, who is uh, still living, or, or until recently was, and um, so it's the it's been this kind of fun trajectory, and I just learned that during the pandemic. So it's been this fun trajectory of initially moving here, buying the book um, at a local bookstore, indie bookstore, getting into this story, and then uh, now just thankful for the opportunity to be with Shiloh and uh, talk about a book that I love so much with all of you. Thank you.